Ah, uh, welcome back. Hey again. My voice is getting worse. Do my best. I want to talk to you some examples. On page 112 in the book, I've got examples of logical fallacies. Uh, and I'll talk to a few of these. So in the first one, one person says, I support the separation of church and state. Um, and it's kind of a common thing in Western countries. Even in European countries where technically you do have a state church, which is supported by taxes. I mean, nobody really cares. Nobody goes to church there. Hardly anybody. It's a cultural thing. They view it as a cultural thing. This, the church is not really influencing the government at all. It can't legally. So they sort of have separation of church and state in Europe, even though they might have a state church. It's kind of a cultural thing. You, know, you say you're Christian. Well, okay, you get baptized as a baby. You might not ever actually go to church, but when you die, the church pays for your, for your funeral. That's how it works. You paid a, a church tax, and then in return, they pay for your funeral when you die. That's it. The church has no influence on the state. It's part of the Constitution in the U.S., uh, but people who strongly believe in this might deal with maybe people from extremes, political extremes, and say, oh, you support godless communism. Well, how did that work in like old communist Russia, Soviet Union, and China, and Cuba, and so on? What? Okay. So, first of all, this is a straw man argument. B is making a straw man out of A's beliefs. Actually, separation of church and state, one reason why it was put into the Constitution is so that people would have religious freedom. You could belong to whatever church you have and not be bothered by the state because of it. So people could have full religious freedom, and that includes freedom not to be associated with a religion. That is the legal understanding of the separation of church and state. It means nobody can force their religion on me, especially using political means, state means. So actually, if you're a devout Christian or Jew or Muslim or atheist, whatever, you would probably want, if you really understood it, you would want a strict separation of church and state to protect the religious freedom of everybody or the freedom of belief of everybody. So this involves a straw man. B is misrepresenting A's beliefs. And it involves, of course, other other fallacies like overgeneralizing, uh, an overgeneralization about um, A's beliefs, an emotional appeal, an ad populum, and ad, um, even a bit of an ad hominem because B is implicitly attacking A's character. And emotional appeal like communism and then your godless and all that. Bring up the political, the memories of the Cold War and communism and all that stuff. Uh, there's a lot of problems here. Okay, too, I kind of mentioned this before. Chomsky said that's how grammar works. What? You don't believe Chomsky? Okay, that would be kind of a false authority. It, it's not true just because Chomsky says so. He has a lot of ideas about a lot of different aspects of language and grammar including syntax. Syntax is sort of a theory of grammar, how grammar works, how can you explain the grammar of uh, all languages in the world, including a lot of abstract kind of mechanisms behind you know, the, the surface that, you don't, that you're not aware of when you're speaking or even or using language. And if you think about you know, why did you put the sentence together like that, there's a lot of abstract stuff going on in your mind that you can't really access. And Chomsky has some great insights. He also has a lot of different versions of his theories of grammar or syntactic theories, which are somewhat controversial. And just because Chomsky says, you know, this theory doesn't mean it's it's correct. The proof is actually up to Chomskyans to prove their particular theory of syntax in a way that's convincing to other people, uh, like people in cognitive psychology and, and neuroscience and such. I one I think that some of his ideas are great. Some of his ideas I don't agree with, and would need to be backed up by real scientific evidence. And you can't just say because Chomsky says so that is not valid in an academic argument or an academic context. Just appealing to the person's authority. Chomsky, he's God. You can't go against God. A few people think like that. Uh, it's sad. 
Again, I'm kind of open-minded. I will believe what the evidence leads me to believe to uh, what the evidence really um, shows. So don't appeal to false authority. Three, this is the best-selling car in Europe, so it has to be the best. So it's kind of a bandwagon. Everyone's buying it, so each to two. Kind of implied bandwagon effect. And it's kind of a false cause or correlation. Maybe even a hasty uh, generalization. Okay, why is it selling the best in Europe? Is it because it's such a great car? It could be. It could be other things. Uh, it could be other factors. Best, I mean, how do you define best, actually? How do you define that? Uh, interestingly, uh, what I've learned from watching YouTube videos, educational videos, some of your really fancy cars like Mercedes, Rolls Royce, the really fancy ones that rich people buy, they're not necessarily good, great cars. They're not so reliably made as you know your typical like Toyota or Hyundai car. Toyota, Hyundai, you know, they put a lot of money into research and development and engineering. Uh, something like Rolls Royce, it's just a prestige brand, and it's not necessarily that that well made. And if it breaks down, it costs a ton of money to fix it. So sometimes sales doesn't necessarily equate to quality. It could, but you would need like more specific evidence, and you need to carefully define what you mean by best. Uh, sort of a semantic problem there. Four. Here's a bandwagon, kind of a, you've got to buy the newest iCrap tablet. iCrap. Everyone else has the iCrap. Okay, it's amazing. Be cool like other cool people. In order, the newest iCrap with 500 gigabytes of storage. Only $1,200. If you want a terabyte, is $1,600. You want headphones, $500 extra. But it's iCrap. Everyone, all cool people, buy the iCrap. Definitely bandwagon appeal. And kind of very ad, uh, and bandwagon, bandwagon is a type of ad popular emotional appeals to me. Sense of belonging and such. Five scientists don't understand what caused the Big Bang, therefore it can't be true. Well, there's a bit of an argument like a personal incredulity. Oh, I can't understand it, therefore I can't accept it. It may not be true. Okay. There's kind of an overgeneralization here. Just because scientists don't understand what caused it doesn't mean that it isn't true. That's a hasty generalization because there is a lot of evidence that the Big Bang happened the way that it did. You can look it up. Um, there's a lot of evidence for that. So uh, there's sort of an ad populum and, uh, and other kind of problems here. But there are scientific hypotheses about what might have caused the Big Bang. There are specific hypotheses, and you can look it up and find out they have some ideas. Okay, six years of statement by Trump when he was campaigning against Hillary Clinton. So he says the only card she has is the woman's card. So here we're talking about a metaphor from like a, a poker game or card game. What kind of card do you have? Okay, I've got this card. So you talk about like in legal arguments and political debates, playing, I don't know, the woman card, playing the race card. It's like invoking race, playing the race card, invoking race to get people to vote for or against somebody. Uh, invoking the woman's card. So he's saying, oh, that's, she's just got this populist appeal because she's a woman. She's got nothing else to offer. So she, he's overgeneralizing about her ignoring her qualifications. There are so many problems with this logically. He's kind of strawmanning her, strawman argument, uh, false scholars, genetic fallacy, um, you know, because she's Hillary Clinton, she can't be smart uh, or can't do well. False cause that she's only doing well because she's a woman, which actually doesn't make sense because uh, I think there are different reasons why Clinton lost. One of them is sexism against her for being kind of a strong woman. Um, and part of it is she was a very weak and flawed candidate. Uh, but anyway, he, she, he goes on to say she's got nothing to offer. If he were, she were a man, I don't think she would get 5% of the vote. The only thing she's got, okay, so it's making false assumptions. And the beautiful thing is that women don't like her. What? Okay, yeah, that made no sense. Seven is kind of like uh, 
they don't write good is kind of an overgeneralization or hasty generalization. There's no evidence. They get, just because the New York Times is uh, critical of Trump, says they don't write good, uh, false assumptions, kind of straw manning them too. And he keeps saying they don't write good, you don't write good, you don't write good. Okay, eight. Eight is an, uh, a potential argument about the Oxford comma. So let's say uh, I love swimming, biking, and hiking. Okay, swimming, comma, biking, and hiking. Do I need a comma after the second one? Swimming, biking, comma, hiking. Do I need a comma there? Not necessarily. You could put a comma there. It's fine. It's called the Oxford comma. So when you have a series X, Y, and Z, the Oxford style guide says you should put a comma there before the and. And other style guides like the AP style that's used by like American journalists and some college writers and such uh, say you don't unless there's ambiguity. So if you uh, say a classic example, this book is dedicated to my parents, Morgan Freeman and God. No, this book, sorry, the example is this book is dedicated. Okay, so there was this real example in time of a book. Uh, I don't know who wrote it. The author dedicated the book. The dedication page said, this book is dedicated to my parents, Lady Gaga and God or something like that. Uh, does that mean... My parents are Lady Gaga and God? No. No. Um, so there, yeah, you would need a comma to, to avoid ambiguity. But in other cases, I like swimming, hiking, you know, swimming, biking, and hiking. Okay. It's up to you. Do you want to use the Oxford comma there? Sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes it's not. So if A then says, well, writers who use APA style must not be true writers. Uh, this kind of a, a personal attack, uh, and it's kind of a, a no true Scotsman fallacy. Oh, if they don't use the Oxford comma, they're not really true writers, or they're not good writers. It's a no true Scotsman fallacy. Uh, let me give you another example, political example. Uh, it was 2012, I think. Uh, no, 2016. Before the primary was over. Clinton was running in the Democratic Party. Clinton was running against Bernie Sanders, the Democratic Socialist, and they had a debate. And there was some kind of controversy, controversy because uh, one time Clinton met in a secret meeting with some uh, Wall Street bankers, and she refused to tell people what was discussed there. What did she promise them? Did she take money, campaign money from them? Who knows? And so Bernie Sanders brought this up in a debate. Giving you money, you should disclose that, or if you made a, some kind of deal with them, you should disclose that. Well, tell us what happened in that meeting. What's your relationship with Wall Street bankers? And so Clinton responded with what is populist appeal and kind of a red herring. Uh, at first, So first she said, well, first of all, uh, more women have contributed money to my campaign. Inclu that means especially small donations from just average women, not rich women. And she tried to use that as a point to counter her image as kind of a rich elite person, maybe cutting a deal with Wall Street bankers. I have more popular support for women than any other candidate, and I've taken more small campaign contributions from average women. So she's trying to make sort of a populist appeal. It's kind of not related to the question, so it's also sort of a red herring. And then she said, uh, I met with the Wall Street bankers, but you know, during the 9-11 terror attack, who was targeted? Well, Wall Street. It was right by Wall Street, and Wall Street was very affected. So by associating with Wall Street bankers, I'm standing against the terrorists. I'm standing... Uh, I'm standing against 9-11. I'm standing against terrorism. Like, what? What? How? She's trying to connect her meeting with Wall Street bankers with being anti-terrorist. Just because the, the New York Financial District was attacked on 9-11. There's no relevance at all. So that's also a red herring. Very much net populum. And not related to the question at all.
and and she got away with that. She was a smart person. I mean, yeah, if I were president, I would probably want to have her as an advisor. Maybe she's smart, but she has some problems with her honesty and her ability to relate to average people. And this is one of the re reasons she lost. She couldn't connect with the average person, which was kind of a lack of leadership. Yeah, there were unfair attacks. Yes, obviously she would have been less, much less corrupt than Trump. Uh, she's much smarter than Trump. And sadly, Trump was a much worse candidate, but he was able to use the two cloak ways so, so well against her and convince people that Hillary Clinton was the corrupt one and the person who couldn't relate to you, and actually Trump was far worse. Kind of sad. Anyway, so I think finally I want to talk about uh, one last thing. That's, again, theories and hypotheses. I mentioned this before. I, I, I talk about this in a lot of my classes, and this is an important point. In academic English, we use the word theory not in the sense that you do in colloquial English. Colloquial English is, I, I think that, I think that Biden is not going to run again in uh, 2024 because of his age and his health. Okay, that's really a hypothesis. It's a conjecture. It's a guess. In academic English, especially in science, theory is a complex framework for explaining something. It's an explanatory framework. So you can't say, oh, the theory of evolution isn't true. It's the theory of evolution, not the law of evolution. No, that's not what a law is. A law is a simple statement. Like the theory of gravity you learned in middle school, it's a simple mathematical statement. It's an equation. An equation or, or maybe a statement like uh, Newton's laws of motion. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, a one-sentence statement. A law is something that is generally true and it can be stated in like a very simple form, like a sentence or an equation or formula. A theory is a complex framework that's designed to explain something. In the science, many theories have been proven true. Uh, germ theory, which is the theory that infectious diseases are caused by germs, bacteria and viruses. Uh, and there are different parts to that theory that together make up an explanation of infectious diseases. The theory of evolution has been proven true. Um, the best evidence being genetics, of course, well, lots of evidence for it. It's a theory because it consists of several different propositions or subparts. There's one about change and development from simple to complex life forms. There is a statement about uh, natural selection. Since Darwin's time, a section has been added about how it happens, the genetic mechanisms of evolution and so on. So there are several components, several parts, which together form a coherent whole, a coherent conceptual framework that explain the diversity and variety of life forms on Earth. It does not, ex not explain how life first began. That would be, that's a different question, but it explains the variety of life forms that we have. There's the law of gravity, and then Einstein gave us the theory of gravity, somewhat of an explanation, at least on a cosmic scale, of how gravity works and how it's really related to space and time. In humanities, we have theories like different literary theories, theories of literature. There we're not trying to prove them necessarily, but a group of scholars will accept it because it kind of works for us. Oh, this theory is really good for dealing with literature about cross-cultural issues, and so a community of scholars kind of accept it and they use it because it's useful for their research. The same idea, it's a set of ideas that explain something, okay, like how do you explain you know, cross-cultural influences in, 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 say, novels and literature and such. I'm not trying to prove it true or not. In science, we care more about proving theories true. There are theories that have been proven true. There are some that have been proven false. There's some we don't know yet. We might have heard of string theory. We don't know yet. We kind of hard to prove right now, but maybe someday we'll know. That's an important thing. So, and then a model is like a theory, but it's not necessarily trying to explain everything. It, a model is maybe sort of a convenient description or a partial explanation. So we had some discussion of models when looking at some informal business case studies earlier. If you want to use a model in your final paper, that's fine. You don't have to, but 
you know, there are a lot of, let's say, business models out there, models for how companies can be organized, models for how you explain how a company grows, how a company fails, how company mergers happen successfully or unsuccessfully. We had a particular model like that in the article about Microsoft and Nokia. So keep that in mind. You might come across discussion of models. It's helpful to know what those really mean. And you might come across, you know, papers that explain, say, a certain business model or certain education model, model of educational policy that might explain, okay, or a linguistic model that might explain, okay, why EMI is so problematic or difficult or sometimes successful or whatever. That That is something to understand in case you are coming across these kinds of terms or concepts as you are looking up sources for your paper. Next time I will say a little bit more uh, about advice for your final paper and maybe some examples of this. All right, so that's it for now. I can't talk anymore, so I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.